hike or per hour, if you will, that I literally had to make two talks out of this because there were just too darn many things to, to show. So anyway, this is part two. I'll probably re uh, redo these, you know, when we can have the room together because there's some video on here that I know is going to be really laggy, and it's just it's really cool. And I and also I have some audio that probably isn't going to work either. So I'd like to do this um, <clears throat> someday in live. Anyway, um, I'm going to go ahead. If you have any questions, just um, let me know or throw a, a little thing in the chat window. Okay, so uh, Land of Dragons is what they call the tour that I um, signed up for. And um, it was organized by um, Jungle Diaries, which is run by Priscilla Orta and Daniel Solis. This is the second trip I've taken with them. So basically they own this um, chain of pet stores, a reptile factory, and they started up a, um, an eco tour business. And so what they do is they find really cool places to go herping, they meet people, they make contacts, and then they organize a trip so that when you go there, you have uh, the optimal amount to see whatever there is to see. And so far I've been impressed. This is my second trip with them and it, it's, they've never failed me. So on um, part one, we were um, in Java and uh, as you can see over on the left, the town of Bogor was sort of our um, focus point. Uh, that was our home base. And um, we traveled all around that west end of the island. You can hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then um, part two, this is a 10 day trip. The second half was over here on the um, right side where it says Flores, Moto, Rinca. It's actually pronounced Rincha. <clears throat> but R. So. Let me see if I can get this to advance. Come on. There we go. All right, lesser sun duds. So the sun dud archipelago is the entire thing you see sweeping across the bottom of your screen. The, the greater sun duds are the uh, big islands on the left, and the smaller islands on the right are the lessers. And so anyhow, we flew down to um, Flores. At the very top of Flores, you see that little peninsula and um, there's a little town right there, and it's called Bajo. And Bajo is a really cool town in that it's it's a tourist town, but it's not a touristy town. It's not like Bali. It doesn't cater to people who want lots of luxury. It caters to kind of the more uh, the younger sporty crowd that wants to go out and do the great hikes, the snorkeling, the diving, that kind of stuff. And so it still retains a lot of its um, Indonesian feel. And uh, it was, which was really cool because we really didn't want to, you know, sit in lap of luxury back here, sort of, <laughs> especially now that we're not going anywhere. So anyways, you see there are a lot of boats right there. And those are little yachts that take people on all these tours. And so when you get to the airport and you get out, you can see that they know exactly who they're, uh, who, who they're catering to as soon as you get off the airplane. <laughs> And you look outside, and it's really beautiful. Even if there were no Komodo dragons anywhere around here, it's still a pretty amazing place to visit. So we um, stayed in this little um, hostel. And, um, and I don't know if you've stayed in a hostel before. It's pretty, uh, pretty plain. It's basically just rooms with bunks and a uh, collective shower and uh, bathroom setup. And they have hot and cold running water. They let us know, which was great because we discovered that some of the showers were hot and the other ones were cold. Oh. So I took the hot one because that way it took a couple minutes for it to actually heat up. So in that little window of opportunity, I would actually take my shower. <laughs> anyway, uh, the accommodations, however, were much better than they were when we were um, on the first part of the trip where there actually were no toilets, but basically holes in the floor mm -hmm. that you squat over. This, In this case, we actually had a porcelain throne. Um, we stayed upstairs in that upper top, the upper floor up there, and if you uh, get out there and look across, um, you get a nice view of this building, which probably has a really great view, but I don't think I'd want to be there in the event of an earthquake. But um, all the way up and down the street, you can tell that they really do cater to that crowd. So all these shops are, if they're not restaurants <clears throat> or hostels, they're tour places, and they have all these... Uh, Signs everywhere. You can, you know, go Komodo dragoning over here or snorkeling over there. And uh, this one, uh, you can go to the pirate, the pirate diet camp. So if you ever wanted to learn to be a pirate, you don't have to go to East Asia. <clears throat> anyway, um, so then, and this, these guys over here, they're uh, 
they know the world wildlife behind them and a bunch of other stuff, which is really funny because it's like, you know, they're endorsed by all the stuff and yet they're not going to any different island than the rest of them are. So anyway, but you get to pick and choose, I guess, how much time you want to spend and how, uh, how, how many animals you want to really see. And I, they probably do differ. We did, you know, have this the luxury of having Daniel and uh, Priscilla scope it out beforehand. So we really knew who we were getting, which is great. We did a little herping when we got there. Um, we didn't spend too much time though, because Flores was just kind of, uh, you know, the landing point. From there, we wanted to get on the boat. But we stayed the night at the hostel and we went out a little bit for some animals. Here's a toke being a typical toke. And they have some more of the, the sort of decalus geckos, which are really cool. They're sort of, they're not huge, but they're not small. They're kind of half the size of a toke, maybe at best, but very pretty. But then the rest of the evening we spent eating and uh, we went dining down, down by the, um, the shore. And the shore is it's really neat. They have this setup. Basically, it's just a street that's got these um, picnic tables. And what you see in front of you is a portable kitchen. And I mean, th these guys have taken street vending to, to the extreme. It's awesome. This whole thing you see in front of you, look carefully on the lower right, you'll see a wheel attached to this thing. And then on the left side, you see these two little handles sticking out. So those handles attach to a motorbike and this whole entire kitchen folds all up into one unit and they were right away with it. So in the evening, all these guys show up and they're, they're about maybe, I don't know, a couple dozen of these all along the street. And so you just walk down the street. They all have the, the catch of the day and you can find anything you want. You could just say, I'll take two of these or three of those. Oh, that one looks really pretty. Let me try that one out. It doesn't matter how you mix and match. They will make it taste really, really good. And these guys, it's amazing. They throw this thing together on the street, and it tastes like anything that you would pay $50, $60, $70 for in a restaurant here. And just, you know, for, um, for peanuts over there. I mean, I want to say, and then uh, we all sat back and had a good time with drinks. I have no idea what we were drinking, but they were very colorful. Um, just to give you a quick uh, overview of the people that I was with, this is the entire tour. It was a lot smaller than when I went with them last time to um, Mexico. Um, fellow you see over on the far left, the uh, red bandana, he's um, worked for Daniel and uh, Priscilla. Um, his name is Juan. The uh, two in the khakis work for a bio consulting firm that bought out the one that I used to work for many years ago. So we used to, we, we have fun sitting down talking about all the people that are still involved. Um, but I never worked with these two. Um, then you see in the back right is Daniel, and to his left, my, our left, uh, Daniel, is Ajis. And Ajis is our local tour guide for the Lesser Sun does. I would highly recommend him if anybody goes to Indonesia. Uh, this guy knows exactly where to take you to see everything and anything you possibly see. And he's very good at identifying stuff uh, when you find it. And there's Ajis. And um, he's on Facebook, so you can always get a hold of him. Um, the boat we took is called the All-Star. And it's a pretty yacht. Um, the yachts there are not quite, uh, do not quite have the accommodations that you might expect if you were to take something out of Marina del Rey, but they do have... Um, they do have sit-down toilets with an actual bowl. They do have water, and they have uh, some nice bunks. It, it, you know, by comparison to what we've been doing the past week prior to that, it was actually quite luxurious for us. But the yachts are very pretty. They all look like kind of the Chinese junk kind of pattern. Really beautiful. Everyone, every owner does something to try to make his or hers unique and very pretty. And I could sit there all day long and do nothing but watch these yachts go by. So we got out on the ocean and we started heading out and we noticed a really interesting phenomenon that nobody had, I didn't expect, nobody told me to, to look for this, but we would be going along and the water's all choppy and then suddenly it would just become smooth as glass. It would just all around in a big circle and, and this, the area would be maybe a hundred feet you know, in diameter, maybe 300 feet. It differs, but I was trying to figure out what was going on and we're all looking at this and I kind of got this idea and I checked with a couple other people that confirmed and it turns out what these are is um, basically there are thermal geothermal vents under the ocean so this area is extremely tectonically active um, there are always at least two or three volcanoes erupting in Indonesia at any given time 
And so while we were traveling, there's a lot of hot spots well into the water, and it would just heat up this, this column of water that would just upwell and just stabilize the water for a few minutes while you're there. A neat phenomenon. Lots of rocks, lots of islands of various sizes. There are islands people sit on, there are islands people visit. Some of them are just plain rocks. Um, this one over here, that is an eagle sitting at the top of it, waiting for fish. And I'll show you a better picture of that in a little while. So anyway, but there are, there are thousands of islands in Indonesia, and many of them are just these little rocks that stick up. Some of them have um, mangrove, a little tiny mangrove forest at the base of them. So we got off on one of these and walked around to look at the little tide pools at low tide. And um, it was really cool because I never thought of going surfing in a place like this, but yet we found something. I'm waiting for it to catch up to you guys because I'm looking at it already. There you go. Yep. You can see it? Yep. Isn't that cool? That is a banded sea crane. I love it. That is a great photo. That it is, is awesome. That's an awesome snake. Great photo. But <laughs> <laughs> don't. Very good. So these things are not entirely sea snakes. They're almost sea snakes. So a true sea snake, um, they don't have to come to shore. They can be out sea their whole life. And they don't have those, you know, the broad scales that are on the, on the belly, the underside of um, all your snakes, you know, they help them get uh, traction. Sea snakes don't have those. These do. They're reduced, but they are there. And these are obligated to come to shore to breed. And they also just come on to, to rest at low tide. They just hang out in the tide pools. And then when they're hungry, they go into the ocean and they swim down and they look for fish. They like eating eels and they'll follow them into the hole because they're one of the few animals that can. If you look carefully, you'll see the um, on this next shot, the tail has a little dorsal fin on it. I'm still waiting for you guys to catch. There you go. So you can see how they use the tail for swimming. So basically, it's halfway to a sea snake. And um, it is an lapid. Like other sea snakes and coral snakes and such, they have extremely potent venom. There is no antivenom for these because there just aren't enough people to deal with these on any regular basis. So if one actually bit you and gave you a good load of venom, you would probably not survive it for very long at all. However, the uh, fortunate thing with these snakes is that they're actually, their disposition is actually really mellow, and it takes an awful lot to piss them off, which gives us a good opportunity to get a really close look at them and how often do you get this opportunity. So anyway, um, a few of us had to take them up on the offer. But the snakes really are very, very gentle. They just, um, you have to, you would have to physically harm, you know, inflict pain. I'm convinced because this animal just took a lot of uh, handling and attention and just cruise around as if it was a pet. But um, who was the first one to tell you that that was safe to do? <laughs> I saw Priscilla handle one in, a photo, in an earlier trip. And then when we got there, they were doing the same thing. They were pulling a snake up out. It was kind of a, uh, circled around a little rock in a tide pool and I watched them extract the snake from the rock and um, had that been like a regular bandit crate not a chance you wouldn't have had a chance to get even close to it um, they did you know we had a bandit crate in the previous um, presentation I did from Java and that was literally terrifying the attitude that that snake has it's a different animal altogether uh, this guy over here is funny Juan um, he's a natural he poses and he knows how to make everything look good and I'm convinced that um, when we traveled, all these all the other tourists were there, a lot of Chinese people, and I'm convinced that every Chinese girl believes that every black American is a professional basketball player. Everywhere we went, they would, want, they would run up to him with a camera and want a selfie. They'd all ask him if he played basketball, and they would want a selfie with him. <laughs> so he, he was kind of you know, a little bit shy about it at first, and we all just told them to just go with it because it'll it'll get they'll have a great time. They'll go home and brag to their friends about the professional basketball player they met. And they'll be on the luster. But everywhere we went, it was very popular. So anyway, we took off from that rock and we went over to Komodo. And approaching Komodo is an amazing thing because it really is a foreboding-looking island. And I mentioned someone how. It reminded me of Skull Island from King Kong, and uh, they, they informed me that King Kong Skull Island actually was inspired by Komodo. So you approach it, and you see these big rocks sticking out all over the place, and it, it looks very exotic. 
It really does to one of us, at least, who, don't, who doesn't live there and see this kind of stuff every day. But we did uh, have somebody play the theme song from Jurassic Park as we approached the gate. <laughs> Too appropriate. Not the Godzilla theme, Randy? It hadn't come out yet. <laughs> did it? Maybe it did. Going to play one of the old ones. Yeah. Anyway, Jurassic Park seemed to work. That's what somebody had on their phone anyway. So we took this uh, tour, and we had a couple really good tour guides. Uh, besides Ajit, there are guides that are there on the island, and they, they highly recommend that you take these. You don't have to. You can stay on the trail, and uh, they let you know what you should or should not do. But they highly recommend going with a tour guide. And there was somebody uh, I was reading about 2017 who opted not to because he didn't want to pay. And he went off on his own little island, and eventually somebody heard him screaming, and a number of people had to fend off a Komodo dragon that it grabbed by the leg. And uh, he had to be carried back and have surgery. So I would recommend taking a tour guide. I mean, who's going to spend that kind of money and go all the way over there to the other side of the world and then skimp out on that part of it? I mean, that's what you're there for. So anyway. I'm um, curious, how much, how much did the tour guide cost? Uh, um, honestly, I can't remember right now. It wasn't anything horrendous. It was probably like uh, 25 bucks or something. You know, which it was worth it. At, wow. at the time, I was also handing him a bunch of um, their money, and I, it's like I, and there was a point at which I got tired of trying to uh, calculate it out of my head. So there's a point at which I just hand him a bunch of cash and, and go. <laughs> mm -hmm. So anyway, um, those of you who right. go out looking for lizards with me or herping with me, you know that I do like to look for lizard sign <laughs> sometimes when I can't find the animal yet. Um, Chuck Wall poop is a lot smaller than this, obviously. And this made me wonder, you know, if, what did the first biologist think when he got there and saw one of these? It's like, unless he saw the lizard first. But, um, but you know, I was thinking about this because they actually learned that dinosaurs became known to science before Komodo dragons did. So it kind of makes you wonder, like, if somebody picked that up and didn't know better, you got to wonder what they're thinking about that. So anyway, um, we did continue until we found one. And the first one I saw was not really big. It was kind of maybe six feet long at the most. And I had this horrible feeling like, what if what if it's a letdown? What if it's just another big monitor? You know, because we've seen monitors before. You know, I've been to the zoo and we've had some croc monitors, you know, at the club. And so I just kind of thought, okay, it's cool, but I really hope that I see something impressive. And um, fortunately, it didn't take long for that oh. to happen. We ran into some big ones. And they really, really are. That, that whole concern was dispelled very quickly. They are very majestic looking animals. And there's a whole different attitude. There's a different feel when you see these things in their home. You really do get the feeling that you're just you're just visiting, you know, that it's their home and you're just there to uh, to say hi because they really do run the place and they know it. And that's funny. I mean, they're just so relaxed. You know, I'm used to lizards being a little bit alert, a little nervous when you come by, even a large iguana. These things, and eh, they're just looking at you like, hey, you could be their next meal, maybe. I don't know. But there's just a certain look about them once in a while. You just look, and you really feel like you're in another time. And then a lot of people want to know, like, what about the disposition? You know, aren't you afraid of them because they hunt big animals? And the only way to explain it is that it's all about body language. So, man, who's beeping? Huh. Anyway. So it's all body language. You watch the animal and you respond accordingly. And, um, you know, most of the time they are kind of mellow. They don't really... Uh, they don't hunt the way you expect them to. They don't just like charge out and get you. And I'll, I'll show you how they hunt in a moment. But um, it's all, it is body language. You watch the animal and you know if it's relaxed, it's just not gonna do anything. Oh, hang on a second. I think I have more people to invite. Natalia, okay. Party crashers. Yeah. Randy, you look really, they, you look really close to them. How close could you get? Um, it all depends on the demeanor of the animal. Excuse me. Hmm. Huh. 
Um, it looks like Donna's trying to get in, but for some reason it's not allowing her. Peggy, did she try to get a hold of you? Uh, no. I mean, everybody got an email this morning with the login information. Oh, do any of you? I can't see it right now. Let me see if I can give her the um, ID number. I will. Oh, I found it. Okay. Yeah, it was in the email. Yeah, Debbie Collier, she should be able to get in with the ID number. And she doesn't need a password. Yeah, and you don't need to sign in either. Hey, Alicia, if they run at you with their mouth open, I think they kind of, you don't go near them. <laughs> now it's too late. <laughs> now it's too late. <laughs> yeah. I've never seen one being overly aggressive except when they eat. This is weird. It says that the host is the, waiting to admit her, but I don't see her here. I don't see her on the thing either. Is somebody else the host? Maybe she's logged into the wrong one. <clears throat> Has to be the wrong one. Let me know. I mean, let me let her know for a second. Hang on. I'm going to send her the ID number again. ID number is 848. What was the name? What's the name of the money that they use in Indonesia? And I assume it's the same money on Komodo if they have anything to buy there. Yeah. Um, oh, God, now you said that. I'm going a blank. <laughs> oh, hang on. No. Guess what? Oh. I'm drawing a blank right now. It's so funny that you said that. I can't, ugh. It's been a long day, though. That's the reason you're drawing a blank, because I asked you. You would have had it. Yeah, today. I know. All right, it'll come to you. You can email me at 2 o'clock in the morning. Come in, yeah. Um, we have a question. We have a question yeah. about the, the Komodos. Do they do they make a noise? No, we didn't hear them. I mean, I suppose if they were, uh, you know, scrapping with each other, they might hiss. But they didn't really, you know, seem to uh, do anything while we were there. So they wouldn't hiss at all? They probably could if they were upset, but they weren't upset while we were around. We did come upon some that had been scrapping, and uh, but they were sleeping. By the time we got to them, they were kind of resting. So I don't know. Um, I, I imagine they could hiss as well as any reptile. But, I'll put. So the question about how close you could get to these things, um, it's all dependent upon their demeanor. And yeah, you can just kind of tell when they're relaxed. Um, when they're hunting, it's kind of a different thing. Um, this one right here is kind of a cool photo because it's um, a photo of somebody taking a picture of me, taking a picture of the lizard who's actually running at him. I don't know how he did it. I don't think I'd want to be in that position. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> I don't know what the story is. Huh? Donna keeps trying to get in. I don't know. Maybe we'll just have to invite her when I do a live and the meeting hall. About how long is that one? This one was probably, it was over seven feet. You know, it's kind of hard to, oh, here's, that's Robert. Okay, well, I don't know. I'll just sit in anybody who comes in. And uh, we'll just redo this one day. I'll let Donna know. But, um, okay, so I'm going to continue here. Um, how, how, how much would an animal that size weigh? Probably 150, 200 pounds. They keep... I think they look heavier than people tell me. They always tell me it's like 200 pounds, but then when I imagine myself standing next to it, it just seems like they're more massive than that. But maybe they're just not as heavy as we are, you know, for uh, for their size. All right. Well, anyway, um, here's a video I was going to try to play. I'm not sure if I... I'll try it, but if it doesn't do anything, then I'll quit. No, it didn't do anything. Turn to uh, an egg. One more time. 
Yeah, it's kind of choppy. Okay, so basically this animal, what it's doing is it's following the snake hook that's got some leaves on it, just because it's curious and it wants to see what's there. I don't know if anybody feeds these things. Maybe they do at times to attract them. But anyway, he's not the one to worry about. What The ones you want to watch for are the ones behind him that were coming up behind us. So these guys are hunting, these two. And what they were doing is they basically were walking toward us in the hopes that we would not notice them until they got close. So that's what a hunting Komodo looks like. It's nothing like you'd imagine. They don't just charge out and get you. What they do is they, it's a very relaxed hunting method where they basically wander. And so they sort of meander around as if they're not paying attention to anything, but they meander closer and closer to something that they want to eat. And they wait and see if they're noticed. So we had somebody that spoke to us once at our club. He was a member a long time ago, years ago. He was a wildlife photographer, and he spoke to us about how to photograph reptiles. And he said, when you want to get really close to them, number one, don't make eye contact. Always look to the side. Number two, never approach them directly. Just kind of do kind of a, a meandering zigzag as you get closer to them. And number three, kind of, you know, kick some leaves around and don't act like you're trying to be sneaky. And that's exactly what these things do. They do exactly, in fact, they do it better than we do. They really look like they're not paying attention to anything in particular, but while they're meandering around, if you kind of watch the general direction they're going, you'll see something in front of them, which is usually something like this. This is a wild boar. Right. Or it could be something like that. Mm, venison. That's, I'm uh, waiting for that. Come on. Wow, this is really taking time. There you go. You can see that now, right? Yeah, we've got it. We got it before. Okay. Yeah. And um, then they have these also, and uh, I'm waiting for this. To... These animals aren't moving very quick. They're moving a lot faster than me. They've got a water here. buffalo. There you go. Okay. I can't. My phone didn't pick up the water buffalo yet, but anyway. So, no, no uh, water um, yet. so this is what they commonly feed on. And so you'll see these things wandering around as if they're not really paying attention to anything at all. But if you spend some time, you'll you'll notice that they really are moving in the direction of something. And it's a matter of whether that thing lifts his head up and notices them in time. And that's how they hunt. They just kind of act like they're not paying attention. They're very, very sneaky. They're very crafty about it. And it's kind of, it's, it's eerie in a, in a way because, you know, we're always brought to believe that reptiles are not as smart as mammals. And yet these things eat mammals and they outsmart them every time they catch one. So, um, I think what it is is they're very good at looking like they're not as smart as they really are, at least in this case. Okay, let me see if I can get Even my computer's lagging at this point. Come on. Do they ever have issues on Komodo with the water buffalo? Because I know in a lot of other national parks in Asia and Africa, a lot of the rangers talk about how some of the most dangerous animals there are the wild cattle. You know what? We didn't actually see any uh, water buffalo on Komodo. We actually saw them on the other islands. But um, but on the other islands, they didn't seem to be a problem for us, but they were kind of scary. So I think it's just a matter of, um, you know, kind of giving them a little space. They just, they're not, I think they're more concerned about the lizards, really. It's kind of weird. Um, I think I was more scared of them than I needed to be at first because it's a little alarming going herping in a place where there are really big animals because we're just not used to that and suddenly you walk upon one. But we never had a problem. They never got aggressive at all. What about, the, pig? what about the pigs? The pigs, um, it's pretty much the same story. They all just kind of didn't really care about us. It was really the uh, lizards that they were all keeping their eye on. Okay. This is a green jungle fowl. I imagine they probably get eaten once in a while as well. Um, they have, there are these, and there's also a blue jungle fowl, which is supposed to be the actual bird from which domestic chickens were bred. Look so at the spurs to see, on that sucker. Yeah. So if you ever want to see what a chicken looks like before humanity happened, this is pretty much it. That's a pretty, very pretty looking nugget. So what's that? I said that's a pretty looking nugget. Yeah, they are pretty. So we went back to this road at nighttime. We got special permission to go at night, which was really cool um, because there was nobody else. All the rest of the tourists had left. 
and so we had the island to ourselves. And um, anyway, so I, I'm not sure if special permission meant that they paid off somebody or what, but we went back and it was really, there was this moment that reminded me of every horror movie I had ever seen. Oh, good, there's Donna. Okay. Welcome. Donna, you there? I hope you're there. Anyway. I'm here. So, yeah, so we had this really interesting incident. We first took off in the evening, just after sundown. It was starting to get dark. We're walking down this trail, and this wild pig comes running out from the left side, stops in the middle of the trail, looks at us, and then continues on to the right side, disappears in the shrub. And about a minute later, we hear this shrieking and screaming. I mean, just blood curdling, mm -hmm. obviously from the pig, or at least one of the pigs there. And it was just like one of these horror movies, you know, where some guy comes running past you, looks at you and says, run for your lives, and then takes off and then gets killed, <laughs> you know, by the Tyrannosaurus or something. It was kind of eerie. And um, it, like I said, it was a different experience because herping at nighttime is one thing, but herping at night with big animals that you don't see very well, it adds a whole other dimension to it. So the Komodos do hunting at night? The Komodos do not. They, so I heard eating the pig then. Well, it was early enough. It was probably a last-minute thing. Oh, okay. It was still a little bit light out. The sun had gone down, but it was still light enough to see. But once it's dark, they can go to sleep. However, you do have to be careful of the ones that are sitting on a nest. <laughs> um, now, the tour guides get to have these nice little sticks. We don't get those. So on every island we were on, I managed to find myself a stick and made, my, made myself my own staff, my and we found a lot of really interesting animals on Komodo that we didn't see on Java. And I think, you know, when, when we were on Java, I mentioned on the previous presentation that a lot of the really pretty birds were not very visible. And we got the, uh, the feeling that they were sort of just undergoing a lot of collective pressure because all the pretty birds we saw were all in cages in the cities. On uh, Komodo was different. They're very, fairly protected. The uh, tour guides are there, and there um, are not a lot of people that are there. So it's, there's just not a lot of uh, opportunity for somebody to go and take stuff. So they have these birds that sit there and nest right in front of your face, or they perch like that, and they sleep, and they're comfortable. They don't act like there's anything to worry about, which is interesting because you got to figure there must be snakes hunting or you know, even baby Komodo dragons, which are arboreal. But a lot of these things were sitting right in front of our face. Um, I don't know what this one is for sure, but I have an idea of what it might be, and I'll show you in a few more uh, slides what I think it might be. Um, but these were really cool. These are helmeted friar birds, and they make this really weird crying noise. Um, I tried to get a video embedded on here, an audio rather. I don't know if you can hear this. Let me try it, and you tell me if you can hear it. Yes. Okay, it's working now. So they sound like they're kind of scolding you. It's kind of weird. And it's eerie at nighttime when you can't see them. But anyway, um, so there are bird, uh, snakes. Excuse me. So I don't know how. I, guess, I assume the birds are basically just like that in that type of a group so that if a snake shows up, at least one of them will have a chance to scream and yell and all the rest of them can fly away while it's being captured. But I don't know. Um, but it was really interesting how tightly they packed in together like that. So... Anyway, if you saw the previous presentation, you'll remember that I saw, uh, uh, it was basically a white-lipped island pit viper, but it was kind of an emerald green, really brilliant green. That's the normal color. This is a blue morph, which shows up on occasion, and we found one of these on Komodo. And it's really an amazing snake. Um, it's, herping there really is, well, I, it's probably, probably anywhere in the tropics. It's a three-dimensional thing, unlike here where we're always looking on the ground. Over there, you're kind of looking up and around every direction, and stuff like this shows up, so you don't want to miss it, and you don't want to, you know, stick your hand somewhere without watching where you're putting it either. But they are beautiful snakes. And we saved this one for daylight. We held on to it until the morning so we can get some shots in the sunlight as well. Love the snakes. So these are the signs that they put out there when there's a nesting ground, and um, which Sorry, is really... Brandy. Randy, real quick, that, that viper is venomous, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay, just, just checking. 
Yeah, um, the stick is long enough. We don't put our fingers right, you know, right there. Right on. So um, the one thing we did really want to watch out for while we're there at nighttime is, like I said, the Komodos don't hunt, but they do protect the nests. And so they have these signs out there. And um, the signs are all, they're on the trail. So if you get off the trail, if you have to keep your eyes open. But just so you know what they look like, they look like that. It's, um, it's a mound about three feet high and several feet wide. And it's basically um, twigs, leaves, and dirt. I'm told that there's a bird that also produces a nest like that and that they could both share each other's nest or steal each other's nest. Um, so what happens is the mother sits on top of this. She lays the eggs, she sits on there, and she waits until the rainy season, which was just after we left. And in the rainy season, um, all that dirt turns to mud and then eventually dries and cakes up and creates a crust. And once that happens, she leaves and they're on their own. And then they break out of that crust and they climb up into the trees. We never did see a juvenile. I really wanted to, but uh, we never found any while we we're there. They do climb and spend all their uh, childhood up in the trees and they come down when they get you know, larger and too heavy. And on our way back in the evening, this, this thing was sitting underneath uh, where the pier meets the shore, the dock. And um, this was an ancient one. It was dying of old age, basically. You can see its uh, shoulder blades kind of sticking out like that and the rib cage. So this one is on its, well, its last legs, so to speak. And uh, we just kind of sat there and, and kind of uh, talked to it for a little while. Eyes teared up a little bit. <laughs> so um, it was, they don't it cannibalize was, themselves. They don't cannibalize on their own. I imagine that once they get to a certain point, or if they just die, they'll just probably be fed on. But this one certainly wasn't being bothered by anybody. Maybe they just kind of get out of the way like this so that they're not as noticeable. Well, how big was this one? Lengthwise. This was very large. It was um, the largest ones we saw there looked like they were a little bit over nine feet long. But like I said, it's kind of hard to tell. I just tried to imagine myself lying alongside and then try to imagine how much further the head or tail would go beyond my body. Yeah, this guy's probably just would be too big where even at, at initial glance, another Komodo wouldn't want to eat him. Because I know the, the, the big ones, a big chunk of their diet is the small ones, which is why, as you were saying, Randy, the little ones are arboreal. Right. So yeah, this one, nobody seemed to bother, but it was lying kind of in a way out, out of the way. So maybe that's what is, that's the strategy, maybe. So while we were there, um, the lesser Sundas are now on the, the east side of the Wallace line, which means that we're supposed to be expecting animals that are typical of things you'd see in Australia. So I was looking everywhere for Australian fauna. And at one point, we're standing on this hill, and somebody, sell, somebody yells, cockatoo. And I'm going, where? And he says, it flew all the way over in that tree way over there. And I'm looking way over there. And I said, you mean that little tiny green bush thing way far away? He says, yeah, put your camera zoom on and see if you can see the little white dot in the middle of the green dot. And this is what we saw. And we kept getting photos like this because these birds are extremely uh, wary. Uh, probably going back to the same thing I said before about the collecting pressure. And uh, citizens are smart birds. I imagine these things know that they need to stay as far away from humans as possible when they land. So none of these let us get anywhere remotely close. So we took lots of pictures of white dots all over the place. This is a lesser <laughs> sulfur crested cockatoo. And um, so I have lots of pictures. Oh, here's two white dots sitting next to each other in the tree. There's another white dot facing the uh, other direction. I don't know if you can see it, but you can see the crest. Here's a white dot holding a stick. Huh. That one's better. So the best shot I got of the whole thing was this next one coming up over here, oh, which wow. actually kind of looks like a cockatoo. Mm -hmm. That's about the, that's the best I could get because these things were so far away. I had to put the camera on full zoom and Ooh. brace it against trees and um, hope for the best. But these birds do not let you get near them. No. So then we're on Komodo and. Somebody managed to, one of the tour guys managed to grab this guy. Oh, that's nice. 
This is the second species of flying dragon. We saw Draco volans over in Java, and this is Draco boschmi. They can be distinguished by the color of their wings and their throat. So as you know, you probably know, the wings are basically just ribs that flatten out and stretch. And the throat, um, the dewlap is basically a rudder when they glide and it sticks straight down. And so those vary in color and that's how you can tell them apart. Now these do not break their tail off. So you could hold them by the tail. And if you spin them a little bit from one side to the other, they try to stabilize themselves by bringing their wings out. So that's how you get the photograph like this. Funny story, while we were there, there was a group next to us who opted not to pay for the tour guide. And that was okay for them because they had their own local expert who was not really a, a local expert, but I guess they thought they were. And so the local expert that they had kept with them was to explain to them that what these are is baby Komodo dragons, because they go in the trees when they're babies, and then when they grow up, they come down out of the trees, and they look like the big ones that we see. Jeez. Made us, um, it, it made our hiring of our tour guides worth all, all that much more. Mm -hmm. Although I'm pretty sure I would tell what it was, even without the tour guide. <laughs> yeah. And I was hoping that um, Rick Rogers or Cat Halsey would be here to help me with this next one. What I think this is, if you look at the dark veins on the tree on the left and then the close-up on the right, you can see it's mud. And I think what these are are arboreal termites. And um, these are, I think, foraging tunnels. What it is is they, um, they run the risk of being captured by, eaten by ants or just um, desiccating and drying out. So they build tunnels and they just use those to maneuver up and down the length of the tree. So I'm pretty sure that's what these are, although I'd like to get a confirmation on that. So we left Komodo and one of the many beautiful sunsets. And every sunset there was really beautiful. And um, so then we left the Loch Ness Monster down there on the left. And we headed out. Hang on a second. I have a dog that's begging to get through the door here. Here, 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 here. here. All right. So we left Komodo and we headed out to this island, Padar, and went to the back side of it and came into that uh, large cove right there. And um, then we stayed the night and got up really early the next morning because we were going to climb this mountain. And we all looked up and we said, what? And it looked really horrendous, but we noticed that there were already people that by the time we got up and woke up and got ready to go, we noticed people already way up there. So um, apparently it's a really popular spot. Everybody has to go there when you're in that area and climb the mountain. So we got to the island and we hopped out of the little dinghy and then we started going up. And it starts out with nice wooden steps and then it turns to rock and you keep going up and up. <laughs> Nice. Oh. Yeah. So once you get way up there, you realize that there's a reason for all that going up. And of course, it's for the beautiful scenery. So we're up there looking at the scenery. And um, as we're approaching the top, this uh, the lady to the right, uh, she, uh, she comes up behind me. She says, are you from California? And I turned around and I said, why, yes, I, I am from California. And you? And she says, yeah, I'm from Santa Monica. So turns out she decided to tour the world while she was still young and free and able. And she ends up in Indonesia, finds this group of other people doing likewise, and joins them and becomes besties with this, um, the one to the left, who is a Bollywood star, or so she told us. And so we chatted with them for a while. And then I noticed a lizard. So if you look at this next shot where Miss Santa Monica is taking a picture of those trees right there, I saw a lizard and I said, wow, look, a fence lizard. And then I realized they don't have fence lizards there. So I'm going, this is really weird. How could this thing be? It looks just like, you know, like a scalopris or something. Yeah. So I took a bunch of photos, figuring the closer I get, the more shots I'll take. So that way, if it runs away, I'll have something. 
And then I finally got fairly close up to it. And I took a photo and I said, you know, that's really weird, but it's all kind of shiny and it kind of looks a little bit like a skink. Right. And it finally turned around and I looked at it and I said, it is a skink. And it turns out it's the lesser Sunda dark throated skink. Not all of them have a dark throat, but what's happening here is in the absence of fence lizards or any agamid that would live that kind of lifestyle the skinks have adopted that they've, they've evolved into that niche they have longer legs they run faster than most skinks they bask on top of rocks and run up and down tree trunks they do everything a fence lizard would do but it's a skink which is really weird because i'm not used to this i'm used to skinks you know hiding underneath boards and only coming out in the springtime and then going underground later. These things are out in broad daylight, they're sunning themselves. It's really amazing. I don't even know. They might be, they might even be territorial, which is you know unusual for most skinks. But in this case, who knows? I'm I'm curious to know if you can if you can tell me. I don't know if you were asleep when the boat made the crossing, but how long uh, a ride? Actually, really, what I really want to know is how close is the nearest island to Komodo? How how much separation are we talking about? You see lots of islands, so Komodo is not that remote. So how is it that the that the lizards, the dragons are, well, maybe they're not, are they only located on that island? No, they oh. actually swim. Um, next time uh, we get to a map, I'll show you. Basically, that whole strait with all those little islands in between, between Komodo and Flores, the Komodo dragons can swim to any of those. Okay. So, you, um, in fact, on Padar, you don't actually see them there unless you're lucky because they, they just support a population of food for them. It's just they're not enough, uh, it's just not big enough to support all the pigs and whatever they would eat. So they stop there and once in a while people get photos of them sitting on the beach and resting and then they hop off and back and look for another island. But they do uh, swim across the strait back and forth through those islands. So neat. Even, even Flores has Komodos, you know, with the towns and stuff there. What was that you're gonna say? Anyway, this so this is basically what Padar looked like. Um, I tried to stitch a couple pictures together, but it it was an amazing view with these big giant uh, carved out bays and coves. And then after that, so basically we were there for the view. That was pretty much it. Like I said, we didn't really see anything other than the skink, which was pretty cool and met some people and then we left and we went around to the backside of Rinsha Island. Mm -hmm. So now that we're looking at the map, um, all these islands, the Komodos could be anywhere between Komodo to the northern part of Flores that you see there. So, and they, they swim across any of that. The ocean is not a barrier for them. There's actually a video somebody showed me of one capturing a deer that tried to swim and the Komodo out swam the deer. It, it dived into the uh, surf and was trying to flee from the lizard. And the lizard jumped into the surf and caught up with it and grabbed it and dragged it back to the island. So they're very uh, adept swimmers, which you know you can imagine a lot of lizards are. Do they stay on the surface when they swim? I would guess so, but I'm not positive on that. I've, I've only seen pictures of them on the surface. I, you know, it's not like uh, marine iguanas where you see them feeding down below, and I don't see any reason for them to go any deeper anyway. Um, so we go into this cove, and it's kind of, it's very narrow, kind of, you know, on the map it looks almost like a fjord, but um, no big giant cliffs, but it was very beautiful. And uh, we saw a lot of fishermen there that were doing their thing, and uh, it was kind of interesting to watch them pull these big nets up over there, and um, in the meantime, all these fish came over to where we were, I guess, because we were not fishing and hung out around our boat. So I spent time just kind of looking over the side. And then there was this, which I have no idea what these are. I'm going to have to find somebody who's an ichthyologist. But this is a cluster of fish. It's a very, very tight school of fish that kind of looks like a blob it just kind of morphs into different shapes but they always stay very tight like that and this whole thing is probably maybe a foot and a half in diameter and it was really just cool seeing these hundreds if not thousands of fish just packed together like that bait ball yeah a bait ball so here's that eagle we saw two of these while we were anchored there um, in the cove two of these were fishing most of the time 
This is a juvenile um, white-bellied sea eagle. The adults, uh, the color is more, more stark, the black and white, it's more contrasted. And um, something I learned while we were there is, unfortunately, I was with a couple people who were really hardcore birders, and they explained to me that for some reason, fishing eagles tend to have white heads. It's not just the bald eagle, but any eagle that spends a lot of time in the ocean fishing, they tend to have a white head such that if you discover a new species and it has a white head, you can almost guess that it's going to be a fishing bird. And then we saw some more yachts that were really, really pretty. This one had a bunch of monks on it who were just as brightly colored as the boat was. So then we pull up to the dock and if it's, um, if you look carefully at that little that little building, the hut over there where you enter the island, you'll see the little thing looks like a statue of a monkey on the top. That's not a statue. That's an actual monkey. And in fact, they're all over the place Ugh. on Rincha Island. And these are uh, called crab-eating macaques. And so here's a picture of them looking at low tide, looking for crabs. I really like this picture. It really shows them doing their thing. Um, the downside of these is that if it's not low tide, they're just as happy to come onto your boat and steal whatever they can from you. And so I got up real early one morning because I heard a commotion, and I went out to see one of the guys in our group was uh, swinging his snake hook at this guy. And um, then this guy went away and then came back a little while later with the rest of the troop, and they were going to try to storm the boat. So he and I were down at the lower deck fending them off, and uh, one of them jumped to the upper deck, and apparently there was somebody up there already waiting because he came back down after a bunch of screaming and yelling. But um, the big guy over here started off with me because I was standing in front of the kitchen area, and he knew where to go. So uh, I showed him my teeth, and I growled at him. And then he showed me his teeth and made a noise at me. And then I showed him my cup of hot coffee, and he left the area. He, he made it. A hasty retreat. I think he'd already seen that trick before because as soon as I held the cup up, he was pretty much uh, getting ready to bolt. But these are very, very bold, and um, lots of people left their boats docked while they went up onto the island. And every time they did, the monkeys were bored, and they'd be leaving a big long line of um, monkeys with all sorts of things in their grasp or in their mouth. And they don't mind at all showing you that they took something of yours as they eat it at a safe distance from you. <laughs> but they are kind of fun to photograph because they do like to pose. So we headed into the island and there's, um, as soon as you get off the boat, you go through this little mangrove forest and then it opens up into this little floodplain and there's basically a little river valley here and we're there in the dry season, so there wasn't much going on, but there's still some little uh, puddles and stuff on the sides. And if you look carefully at this one, you'll see fiddler crabs. And the fiddler crabs has, have this bright orange claw. And what they do is they take that claw and they wave it at each other. And that's how they establish their little hole in the ground that they live in. And um, so we sat there watching the crabs waving at each other. And we continued a little further. And we found a mud skipper, which is really cool. I've never seen a mud skipper in the wild before. Uh, Randy? Excuse me? Yeah, that picture right there, that's the, the, one, well, the one you just had, the one with the, with the trail on the side. That's, I thought you were going to talk about what left that track. Yes, I was okay, getting there. Okay. okay, thanks. <laughs> you read my mind. So that is another uh, example of uh, lizard sign, and that is a trackway, and that is a a tail mark, a tail drag. And um, so we get out there in the morning and we discover that we already have a tour guide. We didn't need one because the um, this lizard decided to take us on a tour all by itself. And we fly. I'm hoping that you'll be able to see the video more or less. So the lizard just stayed right in front of us and led the way and we followed it on in. We were hoping it wasn't leading us into an ambush. <laughs> How big was this one? Youngster, about five feet, maybe. Yeah, I was going to say, it doesn't look that large. No, it's not. Still wouldn't want to get too cool. far. Mm -hmm. 
Now, was it moving forward because it was bothered by your guys' presence, or did you guys just happen to be going the same direction? And it was no, it was just coincidental. It just it, for, it didn't have to use that path. It just felt like it. And it wasn't. And it didn't seem bothered by you guys because you guys seemed pretty close to it. Yeah, it didn't really look at us at all. It just kind of wow. did its thing, and we just stayed right at that distance. And what was that distance, just out of curiosity? Uh, we were about 15, 20 feet at the closest. Okay. So it actually did lead us into this, which is kind of interesting. I don't want to, I don't, I don't know. I, I really hate that these videos aren't showing up because what this animal did was walk right over here and then it stopped. And we kept going because we didn't know why it was stopping. It was stopping because these two big guys were having it out right here. And one of them finally just decided to quit and the other one chased it for a while. And it sort of chased it toward us for a little bit. And so we backed off and let them go where they were going. Yeesh. <laughs> and then finally the pursuer decided he was tired. And so he went over to that building that was elevated. And under that building, I don't know if you can see, but there are deer. Oh. Yep. The deeper got a little bit nervous. Uh, he went in there. He was just going there to rest. He went underneath the shade and then went to sleep, but they didn't want to sleep so close, so they all got up and left. The buffalo were all keeping an eye out. It's really funny. The lizards do whatever they want. Everything else, it's up to all the other animals to keep an eye out, and they do. Yeah, I really wish this video would play. But... It's going, it's just stuttering. Yeah. Anyway, so he went into the steps to go to sleep, and the deer said, thank you, but no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I have a couple more. Um, I'm not going to run this one, but... How, how hot was it there? Um, there were a couple days where it was... In the 90s, the mid to high 90s, most of the time it was around 90 degrees. And and what was what was the date? What was the month? This is late October, and it's um it's the dry season, so it starts to rain shortly thereafter. But um, while we were there, it was pretty uh you know it's, it's not too different than you know the kind of stuff the chaparral that we would be in the woodlands, you know, that we would be walking through around here at that time because it wasn't raining we had a couple storms while we were there but nothing much um you know it didn't feel like a rain for us put it that way and this well, actually not a lot of humidity. the humidity was um it was okay it wasn't like you know I, I, i've been in worse you know, when we were in costa rica it was a lot more humid than this but hmm. again it was this is the dry season and um and it's really not a rainforest where komodos live it's a savanna but was that month the equivalent of like April above the equator? Oh yeah, you'd be right. Yeah, yeah. Move okay. six months over. Okay. Okay. Let's see. This one, I don't want to run the entire video, but basically what I'll show you is there's a uh, this lizard right here was um, we were watching him stalk that buffalo, and. Um, Basically, what he's doing is he's kind of doing this really wide zigzag. Ugh, I can't even get mine to run now. Well, I'll have to show it to you later when we're uh, able to be there live. Yeah, it's not handling it at all. Hang on a second. I'm going to re restart this and then just uh, leave the videos alone for now. Everything everything has been playing pretty well as far as our perspective, just just FYI. Oh really? Yeah. No. Okay. I guess. Maybe it depends on how good your internet is. You know, I see the videos is just kind of stuttering along. Yeah. You can kind of see the logical progression of movement, even though it's not fluid. Yeah. Right. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's I'm just gonna zoom ahead just because I don't know where this thing's gonna lock up again. So how is the mosquito problem down there? Down where? Within Komodo? Um, 
not too bad. I really didn't notice anything again. It was the dry season. Uh-huh. So maybe that changes. There we are. Let's start from here. There we go. Let me know if you can see this. Not yet. Not nothing yet. No. Uh -oh. Let me tell Zoom to share this again. I see what it did. It actually closed out the Zoom, <laughs> the Zoom share. Ah. Does anybody have the uh, the key, the ID number on them? Because I can't see it right now. Yes. Yes. Oh, what? Can you read it to me? It is eight four eight. Eight six seven zero six two five. Did you get that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's see if it works. I think it's working. Oh Jesus Lord, it's a centipede. <laughs> why, Randy, why? <laughs> yeah. That is a very large centipede. Let's that, that, that's the that's whole tundra. Yeah, it's huge. That's the biggest one I think I've ever seen. It, you see that's a snake tongue, right? And you know how big those are. This is wrapped around almost twice. And how long was that thing? I don't know because I was afraid to touch it and pick it up. And I didn't have gloves. But it's bigger than any centipede I've ever seen in Arizona or anywhere. Was it over a foot? No, I don't think so, but... um. Okay. Definitely uh, yeah. close, maybe maybe nine inches. I'm not really sure. Why did you let it on the snake tongs? <laughs> did you it think it was tongue. a snake? Because it wasn't my tongue. Oh, God. Kill it with fire. And it's not better than it's having data. it crawl up your leg. Mm. Yeah. Oh. Oh. I wasn't worried about that. I was actually on the lookout for Russell's vipers because <clears> we were walking the <throat> leaf. Litter and they told us that the viper looked exactly like leaf litter, and I didn't want to step on one. Right. Um, I like the cicada, it's just emerging out of its pupil case, which is right underneath it. <laughs> and then they had these, these are also in those little pools, those mud poles next to the, um, the walkway that we were entering the facility with. So these are crab eating frogs, and these are actually able to tolerate salt water to a certain degree, more so than most amphibians. And they actually can tolerate seawater for a while, but for the most part, they kind of tend to stay in this brackish water, but it's got a mild salinity to it. This is basically where the uh, that stream system opens out to the mangrove swamp. And more geckos, I'm not sure what kind this is. I think it's another sort of adaptalist. Now here's what I think that little blue fluff ball was that we saw in the tree earlier. Um, this is a black naped monarch bird. And um, again, they just sit there on these little twigs and sticks and you can walk right past them and they just sit there and look at you and they don't move. And it's nighttime, so they're not, they don't want to fly, but they don't seem to be that startled by our presence either. Probably just because people on those islands um, don't hunt because it's a park. But it's really cool to get that close to them. And then there's this common wolf snake, which I saw in Java and had pictures from there as well, but I really like these plots, so I took more pictures of them just, just because. They're very pretty. They have this kind of shiny kind of granite look, and they're very docile. Kind of uh, reminds me of um, some of the weird-looking, like, eastern king snake type things. Then we found a Russell's viper. And they really do look like leaf litter. So when we were in the leaf litter, basically they tell you to take a stick and swish the leaves in front of you before you step there. Because these things will be right underneath them and they blend so well. Yeah. And they have a really a not very friendly disposition. But um, you don't want, so you don't want to get bitten by them. But it was the only one we saw and I was happy to see because I'd never seen one of those before.
And then we were looking for snakes in the bush, and I ran around the side of the bush to look for a snake on the backside and found myself right in front of this guy, like, mm. like three feet away, which oh. is very unnerving when you don't expect to do that. But again, they didn't really seem to respond too much to us. They kind of, I think they, like, you know, again, it's a park. They're not being hunted. Nobody's bothering them. And they okay. have. Uh, oh, better in the. Excuse me? In the. Sophie, I can't hear you. Oh, yeah. No, no, I, wa I was asking Robert to come back. Hold on. <laughs> I was oh, trying okay. to turn off my, my, uh, okay. my microphone. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. So yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, these things are all over the place, and I think they're more concerned about the lizards than they are of us, and they never really seem to react too much to us, hmm. thankfully. And then we happened upon this, and this thing was actually truly kind of scary at first because we got startled by it. The tour guide was in front of us, and he stopped very fast and said, "Komodo nest," and it was a female sitting on her nest. As soon as we showed up. She immediately did one of these glances over the shoulder, which let us know that she was not happy, and we beat a hasty retreat. Had we faced from the other direction, we probably would have seen the sign that said Komodo nest. <laughs> they have really pretty doves there, which is really good because I can't stand doves, so if they're going to be there, they might as well be pretty. <laughs> Normal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have any colorful pigeons, Andy? Say what? Do you have any colorful pigeons? <laughs> you don't like doves. Yeah, this is as close as we got to that. So this is over here, a one of these uh, dark-throated skinks, and this one actually had a darker throat than the one we saw before. Um, again, it just amazes me how they just are so unskink like, like they just they behave like a fence lizard or a spiny lizard running around. So, in the uh, research facility there in Richa, there's a snack bar, and um, you can kick back on the bench and sit back with your drink and read a book or whatever, or just relax after you've been hiking all day. And then when you look up at the ceiling, this guy's there to greet you. And he was there every time. Every time we were there, he would sit there right above us. You could see there's a little mud wasp nest right behind his tail. I kind of felt like we should have named him or something because we've seen him so many times. But he was always there. And these guys are just as home, just as at home in a structure as they are out in the jungle. And it's really weird because you could be in the middle of the jungle, you know, far away from any building, and you just hear these things barking. And then you come back, and they're sitting there on your roof. Or ceiling. So then we were told that we were going to take a trip the next day to the River of Death. We had no idea what that meant, and we were hoping that we would be able to at least live long enough to come back and tell about it. Uh, the first thing we wanted to see when we got out was a cobra, and we were told it was a good spot to find them, and we looked really hard, and we could not find any cobras, which I was kind of sorry for because I had never seen one in the wild, and never even been anywhere where one would like to be. So anyway, we missed the cobra, but we did continue up the river of death, and we began to see signs of death. And the further we went, the more signs of death we saw. I'm waiting for the stuff to load. Can you guys see the uh, picture on the right? Yeah. 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 With the, the skull. skull? Yeah. Skull. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is he holding a, a long bone on the left? Yeah. That's chewed up. It'd be yeah. a nice skull to have. Yeah. yeah and I then, um, yeah. if this wasn't enough to warn you to turn back now, we did come upon this tree over here. Oh. Like Mad Max. Wow. I've, never, I've seen this movie before. Yeah. Right. That's so cool. So we're sitting there going, okay, guys, what's the deal with all the bones everywhere around here? So the story goes that when you starts out like this so you have this um this creek that flows through it's a river during the rainy season dries up during the dry season and you have animals like this uh water buffalo i don't know if you guys can see it yet it didn't load on mine but um there you go so the water buffalo i'm reluctant to run the video because i don't want to crash again but basically imagine if you if you will 
this animal moves down straight downhill to our right and it proceeds down to this puddle so at the lower parts of this uh, creek system when everything dries up you have these big puddles that form these pools that last longer than everywhere else so what happens is these animals are obligated to go there to drink because that's the only water there is for a while until it rains again mm -hmm. so what happens is they go down there and they congregate they have no choice and as you see on the other side of this, the, the bank, there's that tree with all those exposed roots. So the lizards have learned to dig underneath those roots and create a little dugout hollow for themselves where they sit and wait. And they just calmly wait, and eventually some hoofed animal shows up and starts drinking from that little pool down there. And the moment it's facing the wrong direction and looking down at the water, these things come running out and grab by the ankle. And then they wander around until they drop. And so um, at any given time, there is some animal generated to drop and die in this immediate vicinity. And they have to come back to the water frequently to drink because, you know, even when they're sick, they still want to drink. And they're even more obligated to you know, drink whatever they can find right there because they can't travel long distances when they're, when they're wounded. And so this has become a favorite spot for uh, photographers, professional photographers, like National Geo people. They basically go there during the dry season, sit back and wait for the animals to get ambushed by the blue dragon because they grew under that tree. So that's the river of death. Did you do something to your audio? audio. It suddenly became very tinny and uh, harder to hear. Oh, I didn't change anything. I wonder if it's just having problems breathing. Maybe there's traffic. I don't know. Can you hear me? It's still tinny. Yeah, you are too. So I think there's uh, traffic on the web or something. All right. Well, I can make out your words. I just got to listen a little more carefully. Okay. I'll, I'll just try to talk slowly and I'll enunciate. So this Komodo dragon is not far from that spot where the, uh, where the ambush spot is. And he was really huge. He was he was definitely over nine feet. Um, I could I could have laid down next to him and stretched my arm out over my head, and his nose to tip of the tail would have been further than that easily. And he had fresh wounds on him as well. So he had been scrapping with another one prior to our arrival, and he had a bit of blood on him, and. Uh, he was just sitting there resting, and then we went further and found the next one, which probably was the one he'd been scrapping with, because this one also had some wounds. And this was right around the turn of the river, so it really wasn't that much further ahead. This guy was even bigger, and he was amazing. Um, I wanted to stand up on that rock right at above his neck, but I knew that if I'd lost my balance, there would have been no way explaining that to my wife, you know. I came home with his few arms and legs. So... Uh, he was just tremendous, though. We uh, took a lot of photos, so he's basically resting. He's actually pretty safe to be around when they're not in hunting mode. You can walk right up to them practically. I wouldn't recommend, you know, touching one, but um, you know, but they're just sitting there like that, and they have a habit of sticking their nose against a tree trunk, and the rest of their body sticks out and looks just like these roots from the tree. And more than once, we found ourselves almost stepping on a tail just because they, it just blends so well, especially in the evening when it starts to get dark. I don't know if that's part of their strategy. I, I you know, it could just be that they like resting with their nose against the tree trunk that's shady. But this was a very impressive animal. Hmm. But he obviously had been tired out from all the, the activities early that morning, and it was time to, so it was siesta time. And so we, uh, we took him up on that. <laughs> and then um, we spent the last evening um, picking off the boat to this channel between these islands. I really like this picture for a number of reasons. First of all, it's a beautiful sunset, and you can see the uh, sun going down you know, right by the uh, bow of the boat. The other thing that's really cool is I didn't notice until just recently when I was looking at this picture. That if you look to the right, you can actually see the side of our boat. And on the left is the front of our boat. And it didn't occur to me when I took a panorama scene that it meant our boat now. Hmm. Anyway, it's an interesting shot. 
stock. But what happens here is there are little islands out there that have mangrove trees growing on them, but they're very, very uh, shallow, very low, close to the water. At high tide, they're inundated. So flying foxes will roost underneath those mangroves because if they're safe, there's no animal that's going to come up and sneak up underneath them. But then when they want to feed, they fly to the big islands on either side. So all these boats go out there, and they position themselves between those islands, and the bats fly right over your head like a river. It's just amazing how many there are. This is another one that you really have to see the video stream properly um, because it's just it's hard to imagine from the scope of this. At any one moment, you could look out and see several hundred bats, but this continued from sundown till it was too dark to see. If somebody told me that there were millions, I wouldn't argue with them. This is my favorite photo. This is not Photoshop. This is an actual shot. It was a Hail Mary shot. I pointed the camera at the moon and clicked, and that went back to the right by at that moment on the night of August of October 31st. <laughs> awesome. That is so awesome. That's badass. I That's love this shot. That's a great shot. Yeah. It's fantastic. I'm sure there must be some Reddit site that I should post this to. <laughs> anyway, um, so this is a flying fox. Um, we didn't get up close to these guys. We just saw them flying overhead, but they are tremendous. They're really big. You can tell the size of a bat by how fast they flap their wings. The little ones flap their wings really fast, and you can't see anything but a flutter. These guys move their wings. It looks like a large bird of prey. It's amazing. But um, we just stayed there with all these boats. It was kind of neat. It was kind of like we all had a big party going on. And, you know, somebody, one of these boats would invariably be playing some kind of music loud enough for all of us to enjoy while the bats were flying overhead. Somebody played that out of hell for a moment. <laughs> I think it's obligatory. <laughs> Let me see if I could fast forward this to near the back end of it and see if it'll work because the bats were right up over the top of our boat. I don't think it's going to let me do that. Grace, you got to come out to uh, Arizona one of these summers and see the big centipedes. <laughs> yeah, you know, you can you can do that, Barry, and write about it and tell me about it. I'll catch yeah. you one and bring it home for you. <laughs> I, I saw one that was like a foot long. It was huge, but it was dead, and it was in the river. Uh, it was but it was huge. The biggest one I've ever seen. I couldn't believe it. I'm glad it's dead. I have a taxidermy one that's like eight inches long, and I, I don't even like looking at it. <laughs> and I know, and I know it's dead. <laughs> Pretty creepy. They're horrible things. <laughs> yeah, I want to be there, Jordan, when you give it to him. Yeah, I'll record it. <laughs> <laughs> you grace and scream like a little girl. <laughs> you'll, hear, you'll hear him far worse than me screaming like a little girl. I guarantee you, that. you bring one of those things near me. God knows what vocalizations I'll make. Okay, yeah, they're not my favorite insects either. Oh, those bats are so cute. They are. Most of you can handle uh, tarantulas, but I can't. <laughs> I'll never, put, never let one run on my own. This is not a flying fox, but oh. I couldn't get a close of a flying fox, so I threw this one in here. This picture actually flies. I can barely air. hear him. Yeah, Randy, oh. we can't hear you. How about if I go really slow? No. no. Just uh, talk really, really loud. Scream. Yeah. <laughs> well, you you sound like you're about fifty feet away in a small tunnel. What if I use a chat? Uh, 
I don't know. Does the chat work? No. It might work, but that would be really painful for you to have to type everything you want to say. Yeah, it would. Well, okay. we, we can hear you. We just got to put a closer ear. Okay. Well, I'm trying to sit as close as I can to the mic. So anyway, this stat actually came from the first part of our trip. This was when we were in Java on the very first hike where we saw that monitor lizard on the shore on the opposite bank of the river. That's where this was. So I threw it here only because the uh, fruit bats were flying, the, the flying fossils were there and I just wanted to show a close up. But I'm gonna stick this back in the other presentation after this. I wanted to um, cover a couple things that I learned, if you can hear me. Yeah, you're back. Things, okay. These are things that I've learned to use my phone for. One of them is time bracketing, and I'll explain that in a moment. Also, GPS of data for your pictures and language interpretation. So time bracketing is important when you go on a trip like this because when you cross time zones or date lines, your electronics don't always know how to handle that. So if you see the picture on the, uh, this, is, this is a screenshot from my photo by gallery. And you'll see it says October 25. You would think that that was what the date was if you didn't know better. But if you notice, there's a picture, a photograph of my airplane uh, boarding pass. And close up of that, you can see it's actually the 26th. And so I took the photograph of that boarding pass because I knew it would help me figure out what day was before and after and where I was at that point because I'm leaving Jakarta which tells me that everything before this is Java and everything after is the um, is on the yacht so had I not photographed this boarding pass I would not know what date that was everything was off a day and um, anyway so I try to find stuff like this just to for my own sake just to keep my own notes together and then the other thing is on the cameras, if you have, um, even if you have your phone set to location turned on, you still need to go to your camera app and do that because I don't know about Apple's, but I know on Androids, a lot of them have these features where if you turn the location tag on with your camera, you can take a picture of something and it will record where you are on the map on a GPS. So if you look at where it says Komodo in Indonesia and you click on that location tag, it'll show me a map of the island where I was gone and exactly where those photos were taken. So later on, if I don't have time to take really good notes because we're in a hurry hiking around and you don't want to open the backpack or whatever, at least you can do this. And you can zoom in on one of these and it'll show you exactly where you were. So there's the river of death. And if I click on that picture, I get the full size. Uh -huh. And so it's a really cool way to document what you're doing without having to carry a pencil and a pad everywhere you go all the time. And I've taken lots of trips where I got back and tried to figure out where I saw this, that, and the other. And sometimes it's really challenging if you're not familiar with the area. So this is really useful. The other thing I learned to use is language interpretation. And I have an app that's um, called Google Translate. And it's really cool because we found signs like this that were all in Indonesian. And I could literally understand the Latin better than I could the Indonesian. So um, I wanted to know what they were saying about the island. It has all this natural history. So anyway, you get this app and you take your phone and you click on the language. So you're switching from Indonesian to English and then you hit camera. And then you look at the back of the screen and point at the sign, and it looks like that. Wow. So then now you can read Komodo National Park, this is the Tagara Province, three islands, uh, largely savanna with palm trees, the most dominant flora, 260 species of coral, 1,000 species of reef fish, two turtles, six sharks, and two mantas. So it's not perfect, but it really does help you understand what it is you're looking at. And it's very useful, especially if you're 
you know, going somewhere and you want to know where a certain place is or a store or something, and you're on a street and you see signs on the above the shops, you know what those shops are. So anyway, um, that's just something to consider if you travel. I really, I really made use of it. I would use it every time I think. Anyway, so that's pretty much it. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask now. You can also hit me up later on on Facebook or, or wherever, or at one of the meetings. But um, I had a great time there. I really did. And I would, I would go on another trip with, you know, with them if, uh, if Debbie will let me. <laughs> <laughs> How long was the whole trip? Ten days. Nice. How long did it take you to get, where was your first main stop? Taiwan. Okay, how long from Taiwan to, to down down to the islands? Uh, it was about what, 15 hours to Taiwan and then another five, I think, five or six. Oh, it's a long trip. Yeah. And uh, gladly it happened all before this uh, coronavirus stuff because um, I, it would have been really difficult if anything happened while we were there. Well, thank you, Randy. We that was really it. fun. Thank you. Thank you, thank you cool. so much. That was oh, wonderful. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, your promoter story is not mine, so good job, Randy. <laughs> <laughs>